Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Man, what a great day in worship. That's so good. I love that. Love that song, that new song we just got done singing today. It's going to be a special one, especially leading into Easter, which reminds me Easter's coming up in just a few weeks. Um, and I am uh, I'm pumped about this. We are going to be adding a service. So perk your ears up and listen for a moment. We have three services coming up on Easter. We put them up on the screen. One will be at 8.30 a.m., the next one at 10, and the next one at 11.00. 30. Service will be uh, about an hour uh, or so. And uh, so we just, we want to make sure that we have room for everybody. And so we're doing that on Easter only. As of now, after Easter, we'll go back to two services, unless you all just decide to bring a ton of friends, okay? And then we'll just keep the three services going, all right? So that's up to you. I wouldn't mind it so much. If that's what you want to do, we'll do it. But um, that'd be a good, good thing. So, uh, Three services, Easter Sunday, so everybody's going to have to move and pick one because we don't have our normal service times, okay? Here's what I would suggest. If you're, if you're comfortable, uh, maybe choosing the early service at 8.30 or the late service at 11.30 because most likely the middle service at 10 o'clock is the one everybody wants to come to. So you might choose one of those. The other thing is if you are serving on a team, we are going to need extra help on that day because we're adding a service, which means we're adding a third more people that we need serving on a team that Sunday. So if if, you, um, if you're on a team, check with your team leader so you can make sure to get signed up to serve and attend. So here's our goal at New Point. We always want you to serve one, attend one. Because we don't just want you pouring out every Sunday as you're serving kids or guest services or, or something. We want you getting poured into. So we want you to serve at a service and then get to come and worship and attend the service. So Easter Sunday, you got some options there. And uh, if you, you aren't a part of a team and maybe you've been coming to New Point for a while, you're like, well, how do I get to be a part of a team? Or how do I start uh, get to learn more about this church so I can get involved in this church? Here's your next step. Get to Growth Track. Growth Track is our one stop shop for you to get plugged into our church. We have a Wednesday opportunity coming up this Wednesday from 6 to 9 p.m. And I'd love for you to get signed up to hear about our, our church, our history, our vision, our values, what we believe, and how you can get involved serving here at the church. Um, and so that's going on this Wednesday. You can sign up at the information table or on your Connect card in the seat back in front of you today if you want to do that as well. All right. So we got that going on. I wanted to give you one other update. Haven't given you a Kingdom Builders update in a little while, but as of today, we have raised 70% of our Kingdom Builders goal. We'll put it up here. We've raised $173,845 towards our goal. So that's like 76000 and some change left to meet our $250,000 goal. And our goal is to hit that over the next couple of months. And uh, so go online, check out how we're using Kingdom Builders funds to invest in ministries and mission work that is local, but also all around the world. It's global too. And uh, that's what that money is for. And I'm pumped to see where we're, where we're at. I'm also excited to see how we're going to reach the rest of, of this, okay? Well, that's all I got for you, all right? Let's get into the Word. You excited today about that? We're in week five of this series called Mindset. Mindset. Kind of the main idea of this series has been that most of life's battles are won or lost in our mind long before we ever see them come to fruition in life. What, what I really mean by that phrase is that our, our actions, our words, our attitudes, our decisions that we make are all a result of a mental melee, this battle going on inside of our minds. Uh, our, our main idea has been this, that you can write it in today in the top of your bulletin. It says, your mindset sets the direction of your life. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a verse in, in Proverbs, uh, old King James English says, uh, uh, how a man thinketh, so is his life. It's this idea that, that our thoughts dictate and determine what comes out in life. And so if you have poor thoughts, negative attitudes, it's going to show up. If you have joyful thoughts, thoughts of, full of grace and God's truth, it's going to show up in your life. Um, and so if, if you're not happy with the way that life's going right now, here's a challenge. Start thinking about what you're thinking about. 
Start thinking about the thoughts that you allow to roll over and over again in your head. What are you thinking about when you go to bed? What are you thinking about when you wake up? What are you thinking about when you're at work? What thoughts are you allowing to reserve uh, their, uh, their place in your mind? Because what you think about will determine how life goes. So Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 10, starting verse 3. It says, For though we live in a world, in this world, we, we do not wage war as the world does. He, here's what he says. He says, The weapons we fight with, on the contrary, are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish, demolish strong holds. Verse 5 says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we, say this with me, we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Here's our challenge. The enemy is at work against us. We have a real enemy and he is trying to determine our thoughts so he can direct our life. And what God wants us to do is to begin to, to harness those thoughts in our mind call out the lies of the enemy and replace them with the truth of his word. So as we, as we weed out the lies and replace them with the truth, then we see the outcomes happen in our life. We make them obedient to Christ and we begin to live like Christ. Well, today I want to jump into another, another lie that the enemy has sold us since the very first humans. And we're going to look back in the book of Genesis chapter 4. So the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at Genesis 3, which we hear the story, we see the story, we read the story of Adam and Eve and their fall or their sin where they disobeyed the Lord and how Satan was tempting them to do so. Well, now we get to see that Adam and Eve had kids. They had kids. And here's what happened to their kids. Listen to this in Genesis chapter 4. It says, Then Adam made love to his wife Eve, And she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. And she said, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. And later she gave birth to his brother Abel. So we got two brothers, Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. It says, now Abel, he was a shepherd, it looks like. He kept flocks and Cain was a farmer. He worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry in his face, was downcast. I'll get to the rest of this verse in a second. But what's going on is you have uh, Cain and Abel who very early on, they, they're Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, they had this relationship with the Lord. And we see that part of their relationship as Cain and Abel are living it out is they chose to offer sacrifices unto the Lord. Cain being a, um, Cain being a farmer brought some of, it says, some of the fruits of, some of the fruits of the soil. Go back there to verse um, three for a second. He brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. See, the difference that we see here, and this is why God God was was angry, is because we see that from the very beginning, Cain Cain begins to shortchange God. Abel gives him his first and best, but but, but Cain just kind of gives him some leftovers. And that's why we see this situation play out. And we see that Cain got angry because God was displeased with his sacrifice. So Cain's angry at Abel. He's jealous. He's bitter. He's, he's got this battle going on. And listen to this battle. Look at verse 6. It says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But, listen to this, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. And now Cain said to his brother Abel, Hey brother, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. And what a hard reality. The first murder is a result of this bitterness that developed. You know, we get an 
insight, uh, a, a rare behind-the-scenes glimpse of the battle that's going on in Cain's mind when he felt wronged. It says that the, the, the Lord kind of whispers to him and says, Hey, Cain, be careful. Sin is crouching at your door. He, he, sin wants to have you and destroy you, but you must rule over it. I get this visual picture that, that there's just this enemy waiting to pounce. It reminds me of a verse that, that Peter wrote in 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, verse 8. It says, be alert. Be alert. That's not even a word. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. 1 Peter 5, 8. Here's the deal. Satan wants to destroy your life. And he's waiting. When we have a temptation to sin, Satan is right there ready to pounce. And this is a rare glimpse into the inside and what's going on. When Cain felt wronged, would you agree that we've probably all been there? You ever been wronged? You ever been hurt? Something was said a careless action was taken. Um, maybe there was an unintentional hurt. Maybe there was an intentional wounding of a relationship. They knew what they were doing. And you've been hurt. Or maybe you were the one that caused the hurt. For a moment, I just want to acknowledge the hurt. Hurts happen. All of us have been there from time to time. Hurts happen. Some of you are there right now. You walk through these doors and you may have a smile on your face, but you've got a hurt in your heart. On the inside, you're broken. You're bitter. You're bruised. You don't know what to do. On the outside, you kind of think that you can just fake it till you make it. Even as I talk about this, you got names of people, situations that are coming to mind, uh, family members maybe, co-workers, uh, uh, a relationship, a marriage. Uh, maybe it's um, friends or maybe not so much friends anymore. Or, or maybe it's even church members. And you just feel like you've got this weight on you from this hurt. In this series, we're talking about how that sometimes you can get stuck in a rut. And I think that hurts are one of those ruts that we can get stuck in. You know, picture yourself driving down a, an Oklahoma country dirt road, okay? And uh, especially after a fresh rain, develop some ruts. And you got to choose your rut carefully, right? Because you're going to be in it. You're going to get stuck in it. And not only are you going to be stuck in it possibly for a while, if you don't choose your rut carefully, guess what? You're always going to go where the rut ends up. It's just going to take you where it goes, all right? So we want to get out of the ruts as quickly as we can. You know, a lot of times we get to choose the rut on a road. But when it comes to hurt, sometimes hurt chooses you. Like you didn't, you didn't choose to get hurt. It just happened. It happened to you. You came out of nowhere. You weren't expecting it. It came upon you and it hurt. And you get stuck before you know it. You get stuck. Here's the thing we're going to talk about today, though. Is you may have gotten stuck in a hurt that you didn't choose, but it is our decision whether or not we stay in that rut. I believe that today that God wants to bring us out of a rut today so that we can begin to walk in freedom and in blessing. Here's a phrase I want. I don't know if I have a note for it, but you cannot walk in bitterness. Excuse me. You cannot walk in blessing when you're stuck in bitterness. You cannot walk in blessing when you're stuck in bitterness. Cain was there. Cain had the, war the warning of the Lord, and he chose bitterness over blessing. He chose to give his ear to the enemy rather than follow the words of his father. And every single time that you and I choose bitterness, we miss out on blessing, and every time we choose bitterness, it only leads to brokenness. And this is exactly what the enemy wants. The enemy wants broken marriages and broken relationships and broken families and broken workplaces and broken friendships and broken schools and, and broken churches. Like the enemy wants that. And he's, he's, he's crouching at our door 
ready to pounce at the next offense. So then we get stuck in a rut of bitterness that can last a lifetime. It can last a lifetime. Here's the main idea I want you to write in. You can be bitter or you can be better, but you can't be both. You can be bitter or you can be better, but you can't be both. Today's title, week five of this series, is this, Bitter or Better. Bitter or Better. Which, which do you choose? Which do you choose? So how do we get out of these ruts? How do we get out of the rut of hurt that's impacting our mind, that we're stuck in this cycle that's all we think about? We think about it at work. We think about it at, at home. We think about it at the restaurant. We think about it when we go to bed. We think about it when we wake up. How do we break free of the rut of hurt and bitterness? Today's main word that we're going to talk about is the word grace. Grace. Grace is how we break free. Grace. So what is grace? Well, let me give you a definition today. Here's what grace is. Grace is favor or kindness. Favor or kindness shown without regard to the to the worth or the merit of the one who receives it and in spite of what that person deserves. Let me read that again. I think this definition is so good that we understand what grace is. Grace is is favor or kindness that's shown without regard, without regard to the worth or the merit of the one who receives it and in spite of what that person deserves. This is grace. This is grace. Today we're looking at a story also in the book of Matthew where Jesus gives us a great illustration of what grace looks like in action. Matthew chapter 18, we have this situation where Peter approaches Jesus. He's been hanging out with Jesus for probably a couple years by now. And Peter approaches Jesus with this problem, with this problem. Verse 21, he says, it says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Anybody ever ask that? You feel that? Could be somebody close to you. Could be a coworker. Could be a friend that's maybe not so much of a friend. (laughs) He's like, God, again, seriously? How many times do I have to forgive this person? Can I just get back at him this once? Come on, just let me. Just let me have one good shot. Up to seven times, Peter says, and Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, Peter, but 77 times. You know, when Peter asks this question, I can't help but think that Peter probably has a specific name in mind. Maybe it's John. I don't know. Maybe it's one of the other disciples. But he's got a name. He's got a story. He's got a person in mind. And in a sense, in a sense I think Peter is trying to, to, to get off the hook. He's like, Jesus, I hear you talking about forgiveness all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I've, done that, I've, done that, I've done that. 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 Like six times, Jesus. Like, is it, am I good? Do I have to keep forgiving? Am I, am I good? Peter's asking that question. When can I stop forgiving? After seven times, and Jesus says, seven, 77, 777. Jesus is basically saying this. He's throwing out numbers, and he's saying, you throw out a number, and it's still not enough. That's his idea. 70 times seven, Jesus is, is basically emphasizing the idea. He's putting an end to the argument. He's saying, Peter, I'll let you know when it's good enough, and it's not yet. It's not yet. Never, in a sense. Never do we have the privilege to stop forgiving? Now, I'm with you. This is hard. <laughs> I don't like it. This is a hard teaching. And I think Peter and the disciples also believed it was a hard teaching. I bet they probably started to push back a bit against Jesus. And this is when Jesus tells us one of the most amazing parables in the Bible. Because I think that Jesus also knew that it was a really hard teaching. He said, okay, fine. You don't want to take my words for it of me telling you to keep forgiving. Let me tell you a story. And so he tells this story. Listen to this in Matthew 18, starting verse 23. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven, so the kingdom of God, what God's kingdom looks like, this is how we should act in the kingdom. This is what he's saying. This is how we should act. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is like a king 
who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. And at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay back everything. The servant's master, listen to this, what did he do? He took pity on him. He canceled the debt and he let him go. Amen? But when that servant who had just been forgiven, when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and he had the man thrown into prison until he could could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged. And they went and they told their master everything that had happened, everything this, this guy did. And then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. Verse 35, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Man, what a tough story. One of the keys I want us to understand about grace and forgiveness today is that for us to understand what grace and forgiveness means, we first have to understand what it means to receive it first. That if you and I don't have a good picture of grace and forgiveness, there's no way that we'll be able to give grace or forgive other people very well. Do you understand the grace God's given us? Do you understand the mercy and the forgiveness? The Bible that we have is the story of God's grace. From the very beginning, Adam and Eve, their sin blew up the world, destroyed our relationship for all humanity with God. We've offended God. We've all fallen into the traps of sin, and every one of us have a responsibility for our own sin, and we've all chosen to go against our Creator. The Bible says that that we all sin and we all fall short of God's glory. Our relationship with our Creator is broken. And there's nothing that you and I could ever do to ever make it right. There's no amount of good works that we could do. There's no amount of, of favors we could do or money we could give or a number of church services we could attend. Like We have forever offended a holy, perfect God because we ourselves have chosen to be the masters of our own life. And give God the stiff arm. We're just like, no th- no thanks God, I'll, I'll do it my way. And so we incur a penalty for that. A payment of death. We deserve the penalty of death because of our sin. But here's the good news. That God loved you and I so much that although we were still sinners, God loved us. And he sent his son Jesus for us. Jesus came 2,000 years ago lived the life we should have lived, he stepped in our place and said, I will do what they could not. He obeyed his heavenly father perfectly in our place. And then Jesus voluntarily took the price that we owed God, the penalty for our sin, and he took it on himself on the cross. That's love. That is a picture of grace. Jesus being sinless and perfect did not have to take our place, but yet he did because he loved you and me so much. He died on that cross, was buried in a tomb, And this is how Jesus defeated the problem of sin. He rose again. He walked out of that tomb three days later, declaring himself to be Lord and master of all. And he has the ability to give us forgiveness of sin and new life. This is the message of God's grace. This is the the demonstration of God's grace. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. But God showed it to us. Our forgiveness of sin, picture this in your mind. It's like we've been sentenced to life in prison for our sin. 
but then we've been set free. Some of you can relate to that. Maybe you can relate to this. Maybe you've been diagnosed with terminal cancer, terminal cancer, and then you found the cure. Or maybe you can relate to this other one. Maybe, maybe you're, you're under the weight, a pile of infinite, an infinite amount of debt. And then somebody steps up and says, I'll pay that for that person. In a sense, that's what happened to this man in the story. He owed an infinite amount of debt. 10,000 bags of gold is equivalent in today's, uh, today's currency to $150 million. All right? Anybody just going to pull that out and pay that debt? It's an impossible price. What does the king do? He wipes the slate clean and lets him go. Jesus is telling us a picture of what God's grace looks like to us. In the same way that this king forgave this servant, God has wiped our slate clean. This is grace. That's God's love in action. God's grace is greater than all of our sin. That's so good. I hope you hear that word today. Because until you understand God's grace, you'll never be able to give it. Here's the thing about God's grace. God's grace is not only greater than anything that you or I have ever done, but here's the hard part. God's grace is also greater than anything anyone has ever done to you. It's greater than anything you've done, and it's greater than anything anybody has ever done to you. Now, receiving grace is relatively easy because we don't have to do anything. But when it's a command to give grace, it gets really hard. And that's where so many of us are today. In this parable, we see the second servant. He, he comes to the man who'd just been forgiven. His debt had just been wiped clean. And this man is asking for the same amount of grace that the king had just shown this first servant, except this time the amount of grace needed is much less. Think about this. It says that, that he, he, he owed him 100 silver coins. In today's, in today's money, that'd be $20. 20 bucks, $150 million compared to $20. These are the debts. One was wiped clean. And the next, the first servant refused to extend grace. And the result was the master hears about it. He revokes his grace and he sticks the man in prison. Here's the message I, need, I think we need to hear today. Is that when you receive grace from God yet you withhold it from others, you get stuck in a rut of bitterness. When you receive the grace of God, thank you, Lord, I'm forgiven, I'm set free, praise God, and then you do exactly what the first servant did and you withhold it from other people around you, you immediately get stuck in a rut of bitterness. And that's what's been playing in your mind for so long. Every rut begins here. Remember, how does a rut begin? Every rut begins when we believe a lie from the enemy. Every rut starts there. I want to very quickly, in the remaining time I have, I want to go through three quick lies that the enemy is speaking to you right now. And we got to call them out. we got to replace them with God's truth so we can walk out of that rut. Amen? Here are the three lies. Write them in with me. First one, the lie of repayment. This one gets us stuck so often. The lie of repayment. Here's what you say. They have to make it right. They have to make it right. They got to pay me back. They have, to, they have to own up to it. See, here's what the lie of repayment says. The enemy's whispering in our ear. They got to make it right. Here's what the lie does. It, it, it makes us say that forgiveness will only come after the person makes it right. Like, I'm not going to forgive them until... Until they come to me, until they make it right, until they say the right things, until they pay this price, until they make it right, I'm not forgiving them a lick. You ever got stuck there? This lie of repayment? Here's a question I'm going to ask you today. You need to hear this. What do you do when there's nothing and no way they could ever repay you for the hurt that they caused you? What do you do? What do you do in a situation where there's no way they even want to. What do you do when they don't even care and don't even try to repay you? 
Or what do you do when they don't even know that they hurt you in the first place or they don't even understand how hurt that you are? What do you do? If you're waiting for repayment, you are stuck in a rut and you will never get out. You're hopeless. You cannot believe this lie and ever walk free. Looking back at the verses, Matthew 18, 27, what did the, what did the master do to the first servant? It says the servant's master took pity on him and say it with me. He canceled the debt and let him go. He canceled the debt. I know that after being wronged, it's incredibly hard to forgive. I, I would say this. After being wronged, it's hard to trust somebody again. Would you agree? It's hard to trust somebody again. But, but listen to this. Trust may need to be earned, but grace is a gift to be given. I'm not saying you've got to put yourself back in a situation where you're going to get hurt again or, or that you, that trust is going to be immediately rebuilt because trust is built over time. But what I am saying is grace is not ours to withhold. Grace is a gift to be given in exactly the manner to which God gave it to you. Grace must be given. Remember that definition? Listen to this. Put it back on the screen of grace. Grace is favor or kindness shown. Say it with me. Without regard to the worth of the merit who one, who, of the one who receives it. And in spite of what that person, say it. They're not going to deserve it. But guess what? You and I don't deserve God's forgiveness either. This is a truth that until you understand it, some of you think, well, I think I probably deserve God's, God's forgiveness. I'm pretty good. I would have got there myself. You know, me and God were good. Listen, until you understand there was no possible way that you could ever save yourself, it is only by God's grace. And when you feel the weight lifted off you and you feel the freedom of that, that's when you finally understand what it really looks like to release somebody and, and to, to cancel the debt because there's no way they can ever repay you. Hurts happen Quit holding on to the lie of repayment. You got to cancel the debt. Here's a second lie. I want you to write in. The lie of revenge. Here's what revenge says. Revenge says, I'm going to hurt them just like they hurt me. Man, this one feels good. Would you agree? Like, let's just acknowledge this might be your favorite lie. It feels good to get even. It feels good to try to get ahead. It feels good in the moment. In the moment. But you're just digging yourself deeper in the rut when you believe this lie. Nobody ever really gets ahead by getting even. There's an old time phrase that says, um, it says, be careful, never wrestle with a pig because the pig liked it and you'll just get dirty. It's this idea that, that you jump into the, the pit with a pig. That's their place. That's their game. They love that. They're baiting you. They want you there. And when you dive in and dig in and when you, when you try to get even and play their game, everybody gets dirty. God's trying to warn us, to tell us, don't believe this lie. Don't believe this lie. Listen to this in Romans 12, 17. Romans 12, 17. So what do we do? If we don't want to, to get revenge, what do we do? Look at this. He says, Paul writes, he says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Some of you need to memorize that. <laughs> don't repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Here's a great verse, verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on who? On you. Live at peace with everyone. You do you. You take care of you. You make sure that you are always taking the first step towards forgiveness. You are always pursuing them. You are always giving grace. You take care of you. You can't determine how they respond, but you can take care of you. He says, verse 19, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, what should you do? Feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. So you're going to go the extra mile to love them well. And in doing this, you will heat burning coals on his head. I like that one. 
Do not be overcome with evil or by evil, but overcome evil with good. Man, what a tough truth. Going back to that story in, in, in Matthew 18, what did the master do? He not only forgave the debt, but what's the final thing it says in Matthew 18, 27? It says, he canceled the debt and he let him go. He let him go. Here's a phrase I want you to, to, to write down. Choosing, excuse me, grace is choosing to deal with the pain and let God deal with the person. We need to get so good at this. Grace is choosing, making a choice that I'm choosing that although I feel pain, although I am hurt, I'm not going to get revenge. I'm going to choose to let God deal with the person. Guess what? He's way better at it than you are anyway. (laughs) He's way better at it. When I have conflict in my life and I've learned over time, I've, I've had some significant hurts in my life. When I try to fight my own battle and get even or get ahead, everything, everything goes poorly. But when I put my best defender on the front line, and I can tr- you can trust me, it's not me. When I put, put my best fighter on the front line, which is God, he takes care of me. Today, some of you need to do that right now. You need to remove yourself from the front line. You need to, you need to deal with the, the hurt that you're, you're dealing with and let God deal with the person. Because God's the only one that can change their hearts anyway. You can't. We need to let go of the lie of revenge. Here's the final lie I want you to write in today. The lie of resentment. The lie of resentment. Here's what the lie of resentment leads to. I have the right to be bitter. Man, and sometimes it just feels good. Like, I was hurt. Legitimately, you're thinking this in your head. I was hurt. I deserve to be bitter. I deserve to be angry. I deserve to be frustrated. And this is what we say. When we feel like we've been wronged, we allow ourselves to continue to dwell on the matter. And when we dwell on the matter, it dominates our thoughts and our mind and it dominates our conversations. And when it keeps going on and on, it turns into unresolved bitterness and sometimes for a lifetime. Some of you have camped right there for far too long. You've allowed the enemy to take over so many years of your life because you're camping on a lie. You're camping on this lie of of resentment that it's okay to feel the way that you do. Well, you're, you're just giving up the battle to the enemy. You're letting him run laps in your mind and destroy your life. Who's really hurt by resentment? You are. I am. Resentment is like we want, we're trying to punish the other person by us feeling bad. We're, we're trying to lock them up and punish them when we're the ones that are imprisoning ourselves in bitterness, resentment, hate, and hurt. Oftentimes, we, even when the other person, they don't care or they don't even know. That's what's so illogical about this lie. Is we're holding on to something and they're moving on. And that's exactly where the enemy wants you, stuck in a rut of bitterness. So what do you do? What do you do when you find yourself in this rut? Let me tell you, the first step, you've got to give grace. You have to give grace. I want you to write in this this final idea. Grace brings freedom. Grace is the only thing that can bring freedom in your life. Freedom to you. All the weight that you feel, all the anxiety that you feel, all the, 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 the hurt in your mind, in your heart, everything you feel, some of it and a lot of it and maybe all of it is justified. We're not minimizing or saying it didn't happen. What I'm saying is you can't stay there. And God has given us a pathway to walk out of the lie and into his truth. And today it means that we've got to call out these lies And we have to begin to walk in grace. That's the only way. That's the only way. You know what the difference is between parole and pardon? Parole and pardon. I want you to know the difference. Here's the difference. Parole is conditional release. Some of you have been on parole. Some of you watching maybe are on parole. What parole means is that the, the, the crimes you committed 
are still on record. They let you free, but it's conditional. You have certain conditions to your freedom. And if you break those conditions, what happens? The full weight of your crimes comes right back to you and you have to serve your time. It's conditional release. You know what pardoning is though? Pardoning is the the opposite. It's unconditional release. Your slate is wiped clean. Your record is wiped clean. It's it's as if you didn't commit the crimes in the first place. Pardon versus parole. Here's what we do. We're good at pardoning someone. Or excuse me, we're good at paroling someone. We're not very good at pardoning people. We're good at saying, you know what? I'll forgive you if. Or I'll forgive you as long as. You ever said that? You ever thought that? True grace pardons people forever. Let me put it practically for you today so you can understand Ephesians 4.32. Here's what God has done for us. Get, get this in your minds. It says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. God does not hold on to your sin until someday later. And he's like, oh, you messed up. Wham. Throws it right back on you. God doesn't forgive us conditionally. How does he forgive us? Unconditionally. We don't deserve it. We never could earn it. And yet we've received it and be given it. And this is how God calls us to forgive others. This is grace. And it doesn't make much sense up here. I understand. But as long as you allow these lies to run in your mind, you'll never be free. You'll never be free free. Practically, forgiveness looks like this today. Here's what forgiveness looks like, and I have to remind myself of this often, but here's what I do. I literally say this to myself. Forgiveness is not just saying the words, I forgive you. We can all say words, but here's what forgiveness is. It is a promise to never raise the matter up again to the offender. Anybody ever use a hurt in the past to hurt somebody more? You did that. I remember that. And you bring this hurt from the past and you open up another wound. So forgiveness is saying, I'm not going to remind or or I'm not going to bring it up again to that person. I've forgiven you, which means their slate's wiped clean. I'm not going to bring it up to you again and use it as a weapon. Here's what forgiveness also says. I'm not going to bring it up to anybody else. Doesn't it feel good to talk about your hurts with somebody else? Man, that's that's often how the rut gets deeper. Nothing gets better after, you know what happened to me. It doesn't get better. Now, sometimes we need to go to people for counsel. We need help to get out of the rut. But when you go to the wrong person, what do they do? They hand you a shovel. (laughs) And they're like, oh yeah, let's get in there. Let's dig this deeper. Yeah, you deserve to feel that way. Yeah, they deserve that repayment. Yeah. And guess what? That is the voice of the enemy speaking through someone who should not be your friend. So, What does forgiveness look like practically? I'm not going to bring it up as a weapon against that person. I'm not going to talk about it with anybody else and bring it up because I I need to deal with it with the person, not with everybody else. I'm, I'm I'm not going to gossip about it, dwell on it, talk on it. Here's the third thing, and this is the one I have to remind myself about, is I'm not going to bring it up and remind myself about it. Every time, because this, this is the one that's really hard. Every time you remember that hurt, it you feel it all over again. Every time you remind yourself of it, you feel it all over again. And guess what? You have to see behind the scenes, this is the enemy crouching at your door. Hey, Kyle, you remember that? Remember what they said? Remember what they did? Yeah, don't go to bed tonight. Just stay up all night. Yeah, remember that? Think about that. Think about that. Oh, you thinking about it. Oh, hey, it's going to feel good. Let's talk. Tell somebody. Tell somebody. That's what the enemy does. And as we remind ourselves of the hurt over and over and over and over again, the rut gets deeper. So what do we do? We defeat it with the truth. We say, Satan, you cannot have my mind. God, because of your grace, I have, re- I, have, I have allowed that grace to flow through me to this other person. And I freed them. They are forgiven. They are set free. Today is the day of freedom. I want you to stand on your feet for a moment. For so many of us, freedom is right there. It's right there. You have a choice. I have a choice to believe the lies or to walk in truth. You cannot walk 
in blessing when you're stuck in bitterness. I want to show you a picture real quick as we close. This is a picture of, a, of an Indian, a South, South Indian monkey trap. <laughs> this is the simplest invention. It is a coconut that they make a small hole in and they place something inside of it to bait the monkey. He can slip his hand in. He can slip his hand out, but he doesn't. They tie this coconut to a tree or to a stake and he slips his hand in. He grabs what's in there and then he can't pull his hand out. It's the simplest trap. And if the monkey just realized if he just let go, he could slide his hand out, but he doesn't. This is a picture of you and I. The enemy has us trapped. And you and I think as long as we hold on to it, we're, we're somehow getting better. You're not. You're trapped. Today's the day to let go. As long as you hold on to bitterness, you cannot walk in blessing. You cannot walk in freedom. I want you to bow your heads with me for a second and respond to what God's doing in this place. God, right now, there are so many of us today that we're latching on, we're holding on. God, we won't let go. We're, we're, we've allowed our ears to hear the enemy and we're neglecting the voice of our Father. God, you've told us and you've warned us that the enemy is right there. God, today we declare to you that we're done. That we're done harboring bitterness. We're done har harboring resentment. God, we're done believing the lies. We're done. And right here, right now in this moment, we let go. We release to you. Maybe as I speak and as I pray over you today, maybe today is a visible sign. You just want to open your hands and up to the Lord, palms up and say, God, I let go. Maybe for some of you, you need to come and, and maybe get, get closer to the stage just as a sign of, of forgiveness that, or, or of letting go. God, I'm going forward. I'm letting go. I'm, I'm praying over this. I'm giving it to you. God, today with open hands and open hearts, we let go. We acknowledge your forgiveness and your grace upon us and we let go. Today we walk forth in freedom. There's still a few of you in here, maybe. Maybe you're watching online that, let me just tell you this reality. Until you receive God's grace, you can never give it. And right here, right now is your opportunity for the first time maybe to receive God's grace. I already told you the goodness of the gospel, which is Jesus died for you and rose again so you could be set free from your sin. God's word says that, we need to believe in Jesus, place our faith and our trust in Jesus. And when we do, we can receive a new life, forgiveness of sin, be adopted into a brand new family, be made new. If that's you today, I want to lead you through a simple prayer in this moment to make Jesus the Lord of your life, to receive his grace and to be set free. If you're ready, would you pray with me? Dear Lord, I know you created me and you love me but God I've never received your grace I have sin in my life and I need your forgiveness Jesus I believe in you that you died for me and you rose again Jesus come into my life forgive me of my sin make me brand new Jesus, today, I'm all yours. Set me free. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. Amen. Let's celebrate anybody who made that decision.